Okay, the next one we're going to look at is a very important <coughs> signaling pathway that's used in many different types of things. And it's often called the wind pathway, WNT. It was first discovered, the granddaddy of it all, was a gene first found in fruit flies. Remember, we had a lot of classical genetics in fruit flies. People had all kinds of mutant strains. Do they still do those fruit fly things with the mutant fruit flies and genetics? Okay. Okay, they just research. For a while, they're trying to do it online only, but I guess it didn't work quite. It's pretty late. Yeah, when we took it, it was all on the computer and it was wrong. Okay, all right. Well, I guess enough people can play. Okay, I guess you guys must have complained about enough that they're going back to the real thing with real honesty got fruit fly. Okay, well. One of the fruit fly mutations was something called wingless because the fruit fly was perfectly normal except it completely lacked wings. When the advent of molecular biology came, the idea is, okay, they found they, the classical genetics said it was a recessive mutation of a single gene. And the question is, what is this gene and what does it play a role in development? Obviously, building wings is a fairly complex structure. It takes a lot of differentiation. Well, they finally identified the gene and it appeared to be coding for a small secreted type of molecule. And then using DNA hybridization, the question is, did we, we don't have wings, but we definitely have limbs, at least most of us, and the question is, do vertebrates have an equivalent as well? And hybridization said, absolutely yes, not just one, but multiple variants of that wingless gene we've got. And they call it, I don't know what this stands for, but they call these things the wind proteins and wind genes. Now we have a much better idea what these things are. It turns out they are a class of effectively like growth factors. They're small secreted signaling molecules, glycoproteins in particular. And there's a number of different kinds of quite a few different members of this family in vertebrates. We find these things are involved both in vertebrate and in invertebrate development. But vertebrates they have more copies than invertebrates do. Okay. More complex body plans and things like that. Now the other thing is these proteins are distant relatives. They use a different signaling pathway, by the way. But they're distantly related. They're distant relatives of the fibroblast growth factor family. Okay. Now, it activates, these proteins activate a signaling pathway. And basically what this pathway does is we have to have, first of all, a receptor. As a matter of fact, the wind proteins not just have one receptor, they have three receptors, although one, three different classes of receptor, although one of them is the primary receptor. We'll see that a little bit later. So they actually can bind to and activate three different receptor families. Uh, the other two get activated by other things as well. Yes? On the board, is that distantly related to FGF? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, sorry about that. I thought we can't wait, you know, we just look and see how. Couldn't tell if it was T prime or no, two. Two, <laughs> two, sorry about that. Okay. All right, so on the signaling pathway, we have to have receptors. A key element, in fact, what this pathway does basically is it affects a broadly distributed transcription factor called beta cadmium. In fact, in last week's In fact, our last week's experiment was using things that were going to affect beta cadmium. Beta cadmium is a very broadly used, widely based transcription factor that can regulate transcription of whole large batteries of genes and play roles in major developmental events, especially things like setting 
determining the dorsal ventral part either of the embryo or of various kinds of tissue. That's its main role, is it specifies the ventral or belly part of the embryo and of many embryonic tissues and organs and things like that. So, if you can't tell up from down, you can blame problems with beta cadmium for that. All right. Okay, so it's a very important transcription factor. Now, this transcription factor, like all this, is regulated, but a key interesting way of regulating, and this is what this pathway does, is ordinarily beta cadmium gets executed. It gets destroyed in proteasomes. So ordinarily, beta cadmium is condemned from birth. It's going to get the death penalty in a proteasome. But the WIMP proteins offer a stay of execution. It's like getting that call from the governor just before you're about to be taken in to yellow mom or all oh, these occurring nowadays. But, and all of a sudden, stay that execution. Because WIT signaling gives a stay of execution for beta cat. And that's how the thing basically works in a nutshell. All right. Question? Looks like somebody had a question or two. What's that? All right. Okay, well, let's take a look at the signaling pathway here. How does this thing work? We're going to start out mostly with our major receptors. The major receptor family for the wind proteins is something called frizzled or abbreviated FRZ. It's called that because mutations, where you have problems in that receptor, you get in the insects and the fruit flies, you get hairs coming in all over the embryonic body as it develops and it just looks like a fuzzball. <laughs> okay, so they call it frizzled. Okay, that's, that's the major receptor, but there actually are a couple secondary receptors too that also are involved in some other signaling pathways. There's one called arrow and another one called notch. And these are families of receptor proteins and they play many roles in developmental signaling. These two can also bind the wind proteins. Okay. Now, what is that? It's not Christmas. <laughs> what is that? No snow on the ground. Okay, it just hurt. Just straight line winds. That was yesterday. Tornadoes, yeah. Well, I, think, I guess they trashed the library pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it just uh, came off. And and there was a lot of the last I heard a good chunk of the room that uh, what they call it, the uh, university or campus in or whatever. Mm -hmm. The campus in the middle of the room is gone. It's like it's gone. It's wow. like pieces. It's gone. Oh, man. <laughs> wow. I wonder how high the wings were. I've been classing it. Years. The wingspan said they got up to like 70 miles an hour. So, yeah, that's right. Okay. But I think it was a Yeah, they tie the roof down properly. That should not okay. happen. I mean, yeah, if you have 110, 120 mile an hour, yeah, you can lose roof. But that's almost a, somebody was cheap on the trip. That roof should not have gone off that's at a 70 mile an hour wind. It's uh, kind of out in the open. Uh -huh. not much yeah. natural shielding. Oh, yeah, but still, they can put the Holy, no, I did. Holy. Cow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or what? Cow, holy cow excrement. How about that? Okay. Wow, that is nasty. Okay, I didn't realize. Boy, that place got cracked. We had a few shingle blocks in our place. Hopefully, the insurance company says you will come up. Well, we need a new roof anyway. Hopefully, they'll say it's uh, damaged enough that we have to replace the roof. We have to replace the roof anyway. It's getting just cold. But we lost a number of shingles and all. Yeah, yeah there was a lot of damage. Especially like in Ahashi, where I live, there was a lot of damage. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, so you go back past Ahashi. Yeah, I'm like 70s. 
up to 77 at what is Boiling Springs Road and one oh, okay. in 77. Okay, but anyway, back to this. Okay, arrow and notch are actually secondary wind receptors. They play roles in other signaling pathways too. Um, now, the other players we have here is baby cannon can either be attached to membrane proteins beneath the membranes, or in many cases, it's also attached with a complex of proteins here. In the cytoplasm, we have our beta cabinet here. And it's attached to a couple other proteins. One of them is called axin. I don't really know what it does, but... I don't know, let's make sure I have... Another protein called APC. Now, APC is interesting. There's problems in APC are involved in several kinds of cancers, including many kinds of lung cancer. So APC is actually what we call a tumor suppressor. It tends to ramp down cell growth. That's part of this complex. And finally, we have a kinase. And that kinase plays a big role here. GSK3 means glycogen synthetase kinase type 3. Now, glycogen synthetase, of course, is the enzyme that joins glucose together to make the storage polysaccharide glycogen, which is what animals use. Plants do the same thing, but they make starch instead. So, this particular enzyme was first discovered because it phosphorylated the glycogen synthetase and told it either to make glycogen or to not make glycogen. But, of course, we find, like many kinases, it has other targets as well. And that's what we're looking at here. Yes? So, the APC, does mm -hmm. it just bind to the beta carotene, or does it bind also to the axon? Yeah, it, oh, well, it's, it's a complex. Joint? Yeah, it's, okay. it's all assembled together. I don't know exactly kinase. which binds to which, but... But the kinase is all by itself? Well, no, it, it's, it's, it's still assembled. I'm just drawing this as a complex. Exactly what binds directly to what... I really don't know, but you can just put them all four of them together. Okay, so um, but it'd be like through this kind of circle outside of the yeah. circles of okay. Yeah. Okay, now, GSK3. Okay, what this guy does ordinarily is it phosphorylates beta cannon. When beta cannon gets phosphorylated, it alters its tertiary structure and falls off this complex. Okay. But then it gets recognized by what's called a ubiquitin ligase. Ubiquitin ligases are enzymes that covalently attach ubiquitins to target proteins. So we'll stick a ubiquitin ligase over here. It recognizes the phosphorylated, but not the unphosphorylated version of beta cat. So when it does that, it covalently attaches a string of ubiquitins, which is I'm representing by U's here. And that's the death sentence. That's the death warning. Proteins tagged with ubiquitin like that end up in the proteasome. So we put our skull and crossbones here to tell you what this guy's going to and what's going to happen to this guy. Okay. So, protein regulation by death. <laughs> so, ordinarily, what's going to happen in the absence of wind signaling is this beta cabinet is never going to make it into the nucleus because it never survives long enough to go into the nucleus. So, no transcription in this case, at least through this guy. All right, now what the wind proteins do is they bind to these receptors. And then the wind proteins, 
are going to effectively cause a stay of execution of beta cap. So let's see what happens now when we add some wind proteins to this whole thing. Okay, here we go. We're getting the active signal. Now we're going to have a number of different effects. The main thing is through the frizzled receptor. And what happens is now we have a protein that binds to it called disheveled. Also named from a free fly mutation. DSH is the abbreviation. Okay, what disheveled does, and I don't recall whether this is a direct, I think it's a direct interaction rather than indirect one. But what disheveled does when it's activated? So in a sense, this is an intermediary for the occupied receptor. Just like the G proteins were in a number of other signaling pathways, the disheveled protein is, and let's just say we got a little structural change from binding to the receptor. And what does this guy do? It inhibits it inhibits our GSK3. So what I'm going to do in the presence of wind is X this guy out. This kinase can no longer phosphorylate beta cadmium. Is um, this yellow, is it phosphorylated or something? No, I don't think so. I don't know. There's, there's still a lot we don't know about these things. It's only been the past few years of the kind of similar pathway together. So I don't know whether it's phosphorylated. It, I wouldn't be surprised if it's regulated in part by phosphorylation, but... Uh, it seems to be mostly structural change induced by binding to the appropriate receptor, the frizzle receptor. And then it inhibits the glycogen and synthetase kinase. Okay, so now in this case, beta cadmin <coughs> does not get phosphorylated. And when beta cadmin does not get phosphorylated, It doesn't get destroyed, so it's still active. Eventually, it can fall off the rest of this complex. And goes to nucleus. Where it regulates the transcription of numerous sets of genes. Now that's why we're going to get some funky effects in sea urchins, at least we're supposed to, by adding things that played around with beta cadmium. One of the agents, so uh, what was it? One of the agents that was the so-called vegetalizing agent. I think that was the lithium chloride. Okay, that agent actually inhibited GSK3 by itself. So in other words, it's um, the lithium chloride which caused an embryo was supposed to cause an embryo that was mostly ventral endodermal type structures, giant exaggerated gut and stuff like that. What that was doing was in effect doing the same thing that wind signaling did, except throughout the entire embryo. So you had active beta cadmium all over the place. And that beta cadmium said to the, all these cells, turn into ventral structures, turn into endoderm, and things like that. Okay. And then, of course, the other thing, the nickel chloride effectively, by, I don't think we really know how, but basically took out, uh, took out beta cadmium entirely throughout the whole embryo, so you didn't get any ventral or endodermal structures. And that's where you have the little fuzzy ciliated ball, the so-called animalized embryo. So we can see in those kind of experiments that artificially doing things to beta cannon, we could see dramatic effects in things like early embryonic axis formation and organization and what's belly and what's back and all that type of stuff. In nature, wind signaling plays a major role. It's not the only thing, but there are other aspects that can either lead to the destruction or the salvation of beta cannon. 
But once again, it plays important roles, this kind of signaling pattern. Now these, we're not sure exactly how these things affect things, but we do know that the notch receptor, yes? When you said uh, beta catenin, it falls off the complex and then goes to the nucleus? Yeah. So what are the other two importance oh, about the beta catenin? I just if they're left them behind somewhere. Mm -hmm. They're left behind, yeah. I was probably what's going on is interaction and inhibition of this will cause this to fall off. That would be my guess. I don't know for sure. I don't think they have, they may have the structure of beta catenin. I don't think they have the detailed structure of all these. They may have APC too because it's a important in several kinds of cancer. So the drug companies want to get the structure of that protein real quickly. Uh, so they can make more treatments and stuff like that. Okay, so uh, however that happens, somehow this thing goes into the nucleus. All right. Um, now, like you say, these other receptors do seem to play some kinds of roles. Exactly what it does, a little bit hard to say. Um, one of the things the arrow does is actually also inhibits another signaling pathway. In the presence of wind proteins, this aeroreceptor inhibits an enzyme called JNK or Janus kinase. Now, Janus kinase is involved in something called the JAK, J A K, STAT pathway. That's a signaling pathway. We haven't mentioned that, but that's a signaling pathway that plays a number of developmental roles, especially development of the blood cells. Many of these so-called cytokines or calmly stimulating factors that stimulate uh, differentiation and division of cells in your blood system from the uh, uh, original stem cells in your bone marrow, many of them utilize this pathway. So that's one that's widely used in things like the blood and the immune system. So the wind signaling will actually inhibit that pathway through the aeroreceptor, another one of these guys. Yes? Do all of these They, well, they, they can't. If there's wind around and those receptors are there in the particular cell type, all three of them will work. Their modes of action are going to be different. Exactly what they do may be different. Okay, so, but like if we were trying to draw it out mm -hmm. because it's going to get confusing, we would do the frizz and it would, yeah. it would leave off the kinase and yeah. it would get transcripted. Focus then, mostly on the frizzle receptor. That's the primary receptor. These others are secondary and they don't seem to have as much or perhaps very little effect on the beta cadmium compared to the frizzle receptor. It just, uh, one point I put this thing down is we mentioned before that one signaling pathway can interact with another. Here's an example. You activate wind signaling, you inhibit this signaling pathway through a different receptor. Okay, so that's basically how this thing, yes? Okay, so, um, Okay, you know, that one, I'm not sure that you know, notch is an important family of signaling molecules in development. I actually don't know offhand what it does. It, has, it does have many effects in stimulating cell differentiation. It's just one of those kind of things that, you know, how many signaling pathways do you cover? So I really haven't looked that one up, but I see this all the time in the literature about notch signaling being involved in this process and that process and thing. And I think it also has its own separate molecules that bind to it in addition to the winds. So when winds bind, it will it will activate the notch signaling. Uh, well, at least it will activate an element of it. Um, uh, the rest of the signaling, I actually don't know. I have a big poster of signaling pathways in my office. I take a look at that one to see. But uh, I'm not sure exactly what the regular classic notch signaling does. I think it may have something to do with activating certain kinds of phosphorylated, heavily phosphorylated phospholipids. And those, in turn, act in a sense kind of like the IP3 and DAG. I think, don't quote me on that, but I think notch plays a role in that. And some of these heavily phosphorylated lipids play roles in this process, too. Okay? But don't quote me on that. <laughs>
So if if when um, binds to the arrow receptor, mm -hmm. then it inhibits that sensitivity. Yes. Okay, and then for this whole Wnt pathway, uh -huh. we have to have Wnt binding to all three of the receptors for it to work. No, no, it could no. bind to any one of those things. The one major is. effect is if it one. binds to the frizzle receptor. So. Mm -hmm. That's the one that's going to really have a big, big, big time effect on beta cat. The others are kind of like secondary receptors with other effects. So they're not really necessary for this pathway completely. Right. Yeah. It can do the, you do other things through other receptors, but the main thing with the beta cat is through the crystal receptor. Okay. okay. Did that help? Yes. Um, what if you have went binding to the frizzle receptor uh -huh. and you don't have went binding to the arrow receptor? Can that happen? And will that would be very hard. <laughs> that would be very hard. <laughs> That's actually interesting. It is an interesting question. That would be pretty hard because if there's wind around and you've got those receptors, you have all three receptors, there should be at least some binding. Now here's where you get to the touchy part. How strongly do each of these receptors bind the winds. Now that I don't know, I'm sure somebody does, but let's suppose the frizzle receptor binds the wind protein a hundred times as effectively as the arrow notch receptor. That way you can have a little bit of wind around, turn on the frizzle receptors, but not the other two because they're so little around and they bind so weakly. If it, remember we mentioned concentration counts? Now on the other hand in that case, and I really don't know how strong one binds the other, but on the other hand, let's suppose we had a ton of wind proteins around. Then you'd activate everything all at once. So yeah, it's possible you could activate one preferentially without the other, but it just depends on how tight the binding to each of the receptors are. And that's something I do not know, although I bet somebody has probably measured that, because <laughs> these are pretty well-known receptors. So I would be surprised if somebody's taking a good look at it and say, hey, how tight is the binding? But that's one of these kind of things. If they vary, if these receptors vary quite a bit on how tightly they bind, what we sometimes call the affinity for the wind proteins, uh, and they vary by a couple orders of magnitude, you could easily get a situation where you activate one of these and not the others. Okay, did that help? Yes, I have one last question. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> and she knows what she does on these exams. There's a reason for asking these questions. <laughs> Most of the time, like almost all of the time, if the Wnt pathway is activated, then that Janus pathway the is Janus thing, Yeah, that, that probably okay. shut that pathway off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, that's what we've got here with the basics of how this signaling pathway works and a little bit about binding affinities and stuff like that. Uh, and I'll pop in a couple of questions. But all right. Now, What's that going Oh, okay. It's going to be perfect. We definitely will not go through. The thing I did not put anything with pitch about on this exam. I thought we might not get through it. Okay, we're absolutely certain we won't. Okay.